Another disappointing week in Asia for our Australian club participants will hopefully be soon replaced by success in Asia for the men's national team. Tony Popovich will name his second squad for the Socceroos, who have the massive task of Saudi Arabia and Bahrain on their hands this time around. Two teams who are level on points with Australia to take us over the halfway point in the third phase of World Cup qualification. One name is already known as we record on Thursday night, but we'll take a bit of a punt and put forward our bolters from the A-League as well. The teams for round four of the A-League are in, headlined by several devastating additions to the injury list. A-League crowns are on the up and the APL have re-elected members of the board at their AGM, but we have no idea how on this episode of the Round Ball Australia podcast. My name is Lachlan Abel and joining me tonight is Christian Monskin. Christian, once again, not a great week for the Australian club coefficient. You know, good evening, Lockie. You're always on about the coefficient. It always, <laughs> you know, it's deep into the soul. Um, yeah, the coefficients this week, obviously not not good reading. Um, that late equaliser for the Mariners restored some parity, but yeah, another uh, another loss, shall I say, for Sydney. Um, it's not good, is it? No, it's not ideal, certainly. Jacob Stevens, hello to you. But for once, for the Mariners, they're actually not... Uh, the most disappointing results out of the round. <laughs> it's like it's like a disappointed parent talking about their, <laughs> their, their one child who finally does something right. And it's, they're not the disappointment this week. It's a bit of surprise. Jacob bringing but... back some dark memories. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, no, it's, uh, it's, it's nice that, yeah, the Mariners were able to, to get a result there because they have been sort of misfiring a lot. And, um, you know, we, like, and we know they like to score late goals and uh, they got another one. It was a, a tidy little finish as well. But... Um, yeah, still lacking the that big bag of points that they need because you know qualification to the next stage is getting further and further away for the Mariners now with every time they fail to get a win. So uh, you know, really backs up against the wall now at this point. And I think you mentioned it before we we started recording. What is it that they haven't won a game since the grand final? Yeah, so competitive one. You know, yeah. That's that's an insane stat for a team like the Mariners to have. So, yeah, really big uh, big moments coming up for them um, in the next few weeks because they've they've really got to turn something around here because it's not looking good for them at the moment. Yeah, well, we will get stuck into the Mariners. A little bit of housekeeping before we get underway tonight. Of course, we're giving away tickets to Unite Round uh, as well. The big Saturday derby, uh, Sydney derby on Saturday. There we go. Uh, All you have to do, uh, if you want those tickets, there's a Google form in the description of this podcast and all of our stuff from the last week or so. Answer a few questions. uh, And and how we're going to judge this is we've asked uh, everyone in 50 words or less to describe their best A-League moment. And one submission we had uh, off Tuesday's episode, Napoleon says the 99th minute equaliser for the Phoenix last year in the semifinals against Victory. Last year was my first season of the A-League. That goal encompasses everything I love about soccer. We'll forgive that one. Uh, I'm not even a Knicks supporter, but watching that last second moment and the crowd erupts was momentous. And that really plays on me, Christian, because I really love that moment as well. Uh, just the, the whole celebration and the culmination of that year for the Phoenix. Uh, I think that's a very good pick. Yeah, definitely. I was obviously watching the game, you know, being a Victory fan and seeing that. Honestly, a part of me actually enjoyed it because the fan, the yeah. atmosphere was obviously a sellout mm-hmm. stadium. You just wanted that for the league. It was such a great vibe. And unfortunately for them, they couldn't get the job done in extra time. But in that specific moment, it was just, yeah, a great advertisement for the league. All right. Well, if you have a favorite A-League moment, we'd love to hear it. And you can get yourself in the running for some free Unite Round tickets as well. And then the other bit of housekeeping is that Round Ball Australia, the podcast, for Monday nights is now a live show. We're going to be trying to go live at 7.30 p.m. Eastern time uh, or daylight time for now, at least, uh, on YouTube. Uh, And it's just a normal podcast, normal format, but with a live production attached to it. So uh, if you're free and able on Monday nights, we'd love to have your company. Uh, But let's get stuck into it. And we're going to start with the Socceroos because Tony Popovich is going to name his squad on Friday morning. Uh, We are here on Thursday night, so we have not seen the full list uh, but Jacob, the one thing we do know is that per uh, News Corp's Marco Monteverde is that Anthony Caceres is set to uh, be included in the team. We saw with Luke Bratton's selection in the last window that Popovich uh, is, you know, willing to select and give a chance to previously overlooked A-League talents, let's let's call mm. it. Uh, and then it seems that Anthony Caceres, who has been a very consistent performer in the league and has had a very good start to the season, it must be said as well, uh, who, and is often called uh, probably one of Australia's best players to ever not receive a Socceroos cap. So uh, it seems he's going to get his opportunity here. 
Yeah. Um, I mean, it seems a better pick than Luke Bratton, at least on paper as well with the season that he's had. He's he's looked much more impressive than than Bratton has done. He's always been sort of on the fringes of, of selection, hasn't he? Always one of those names that has popped up in conversation. But uh, as you mentioned, Bucky, never never quite had that chance. And, um, you know, it's it's fantastic to see that he will be given that chance. I think that he's that sort of technical midfielder that Australia perhaps have, have lacked recently. And that's not to say he's going to come in and start and be the world's greatest player and oh why wasn't he picked earlier sort of thing but it does seem like perhaps he's been overlooked all this time because he does have a few of the qualities that that perhaps w- was something that the the side needed but no it, it's great to see that happening and it's good to see popper as well coming in and and, and not neglecting the a-leagues either like he, he's sort of obviously spent uh, most of his career here coaching here but um to, to recognize the talent that does exist in the leagues as well that's a boost for for the players that are playing here it's a boost for the clubs as well because that's a point of retention is you know now you don't necessarily have to go overseas to be able to represent the australian national team right like you know we, we we've proven time after time now that if you're good enough here you're good enough for for the socceroos as well and and this is just another case that, that proves that and uh, i can't remember who it was on commentary the other day that was mentioning caceres and saying how has he not been chosen for the soccer regime. It might have been Andy Harper. Yeah, probably. And, uh, <laughs> and and now, you know, um, you know, a few nights later, all of a sudden we know that he has been selected. Maybe that was maybe that was a bit of, you know, insider knowledge there or oh. something from Harps or, or just pure speculation. I think he's but... been saying it for a while, to be fair. He has he's been. been he has been. A conspiracy yeah. theorist, Jay. <laughs> <laughs> but no, it's, uh, it's awesome to see. And, uh, you know, excited to see who else from the A-League might actually make it mm. into the squad as well now. Well, let's dig into some of those names, Christian. Uh, the the guys on Total A Legs, I believe, is the name. Uh, Tommy Orr and Vince Ugari had a ponder at a few. Marin Yakalish has been talked about. Obviously, um, he came to Australia, um, you know, not as a regularly known Australian, but he carries an Australian passport through his heritage, so he's eligible and he's had a really good start uh, for Macarthur. Uh, it is a very interesting question, I think, as well in that winger position. Uh, on Daniel Azani, he was picked in the last squad, but has not played a lot of A League minutes since then, and has actually been kept out of the team by a very good Reno Piscopo. Uh, mm-hmm. So I think Reno is still a very big outsider, and he has to have a little more consistency. And I'd make that same argument for Yakalich as well. But there's definitely a, an interesting discussion there, especially considering that Craig Goodwin will not be eligible for the first game due to suspension. Yeah, I mean. In terms of that Goodwin suspension, if you're going off form, then you'd probably have to lean towards Piscopo because, you know, so far, Kiss Norbert has gone the best out of him, um, it must be said. Besides that one, the goal he scored, I think, you know, he's been involved in the build-up play time and time again. He's really shown his capability and not that he did in previous clubs like Wellington, for example. I just think the environment there probably didn't suit him to actually, you know, star in that in that role. Um, even with the Jets as well, he had glimpses there, but... I thought, you know, there's more to this kid. And now that he's arrived at victory, a fresh new start, and you can tell the talent's just shining through now. So with Ozani, he hasn't started a game yet this season. Obviously got dropped from the squad entirely for the Australia Cup. And Kisnobo has admitted in his post-match press conferences that not just Ozani, but the whole playing group has to prove their worth and try and get back into the starting 11. So it's not like Azani's just going to stroll through. And when you've got players like Piscopo who are producing good performances week in, week out, then it's going to make it very difficult for Azani to get, you know, at least a consistent look in, in the starting 11. And that gives Popovich, you know, more questions than answers um, when it comes to that. Because, yeah, I saw Popovich, he was at the game uh, watching from the stands. It's funny, I was actually in the elevator with him um, on the way up. I was so I was so keen to ask him just a few questions, but I thought, nah, too shy, I can't do that. Um, but no, that's just a fascinating sort of, um, I guess, debate for Popovich in his head to say, okay, I've been sort of loyal towards Azani, but with Piscopo sort of, you know, coming up and proving his worth, do I go with a more unproven international, which he's done with Volupole. We did not expect mm. Volupole to get caught up at all in the last mm. uh, international window, along with Luke Braddon. And not just that, he actually started Luke Braddon against Japan. So it's not just that yeah. he's called them up. And that could be the same with Caceres, where he can just throw Caceres in the deep end against Saudi Rep and say, hey, okay, you've done well. You start it and show us what you can do. Uh, Popovich is the type of manager who can just spring those surprises. So, um, yeah, there's definitely a few questions there um, to consider. And the other thing, and I'll get our ta- resident tactician to speak on this, but the advantage for specifically Piscopo and Arzani, I think, Jacob, is that 
looking at how Popovich played those last two games with the, mm. you know, traditional wingers actually being asked to play inside as more yeah. 10 kind of creative players in those inside channels. That is, is exactly what uh, Kiz Norbo is asking his left-sided winger to do. So Arzani and Piscopo both have experience playing that role. Yeah, uh, that that's definitely a big tick for those two over Yakalish, who... I mean, he he sort of has done that a little bit for MacArthur this season, but only in certain phases of play. Um, and it's typically when Jed Drew would get the ball and he'd move inside to be able to make a late run in the box to to meet the cross. But he he has played as the the wide player on that left hand side for MacArthur this season. So if you you're looking at, at Popovich's system that he set up for the Socceroos now, you go, yeah, uh, Piscopo and Arzani definitely make a lot more sense there. And I think of the two obviously Piscopo's played more recently. Does Arzani perhaps have more of that individual skill set to to work better in a lot of the situations that these wingers found themselves in in the last couple of games where it is a little bit of, you know, there's tighter spaces, you're going to be closed much more quickly and you're going to have a little bit less support from the midfield than perhaps you do when you're playing for victory with uh, Ryan and Teague and Jordi Valadon behind you. Um, so, you know, he's going to have to weigh up those options there. But I also, I also wouldn't put it entirely past him to, to switch up what he does with the squad entirely um in in the post-match presser after the china game everyone was super surprised obviously that he's come out with this new style of of, of football at least for him and the socceroos where those wingers are inverting um very early in build up and you know he was being asked a lot of questions about that and he was saying well i just do what i think is best for the squad that i've got available so, you know, if perhaps he doesn't have the, the personnel available to make it work, he might have to switch things. And we know that, that Popovich, he loves to have a plan A and stick with it. And the way that he makes adjustments is through substitutions and changing personnel rather than tactical adjustments. But he's made it clear that as Socceroos coach, uh, it, obviously international management is a different beast entirely because you can't work with these players for extended periods of time. So you do just have to do whatever you can do with the squad that you have. So, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if he feels like perhaps the the squad that's needed to play that style of football isn't available, that he does try and switch things up. But I do think that Piscopo and Arzani both have the obviously proven ability to play in that role. It, it might even be, you know, a, a completely rogue outside shout where he brings in you know, a, a more central player to, to play in that role. Uh, you know, you, you can't be sure, but of the A-League talent that we've got available, yeah, definitely it's going to be between, I'd say, Piscopo and Arzani. And I think you've just got to weigh up what the opposition are going to do as to which one of them you'd pick because, you know, I think Arzani perhaps works a little bit ba better in tight spaces and Piscopo um, has been fantastic for the victory this season in creating his own space. Um, and that's something that he's done very well. So, uh, yeah, it, it's going to be interesting to see if either of them are picked and, and if they are, um, which one it is. Christian, any other A-League bolters you've got your eye on? Um, A-League bolters. Probably the other one that stands out is Ryan T, only because I've watched a lot of him play. And I'd probably include Jordi Valadon in that um, conversation as well. But Ryan T, I think, is a bit <laughs> we, more, we can't I just pick victory players. It just becomes <laughs> a victory <laughs> team. No, because no, I've, I've debated that it's the best midfield in the league. And I think Popovich at some point will definitely look to those two in the near future, whether that's now against, in this, against Saudi Arabia or in the near future, that's sort of to be determined. But I think... Um, you know, for sure, at least Ryan T may get a look in. Um, maybe it's an outside chance. Um, I do think he has, you know, he links up well from defense to midfield. He's sort of not that boxer box type player, but one who can create chances. He can sort of soak up pressure, uh, protect the back four or the back three, whatever Popovich opts to go for in his soccer room setup. So um, there is that bit of versatility there. And he's, yeah, one for me um, who could be a shout. The, uh, the case also continues to build for Max Ballard to be included in the squad if Will was here. Uh, I'm sure he would have brought him uh, up as well. <laughs> he has not missed a minute in the league for NAC Brada in the Eredivisie uh, since his debut. Uh, and according to the, to the Dutch media, is a very large part of uh, Breda's very good start to the season over there. He's collecting a lot of acclaim, Jacob. And if you're doing yeah. that in a league like the Eredivisie, which is you know, right on the doorstep of those big five European leagues that we think about. Uh, surely he has to be in the mix or at least very, very close to. 
Uh, you'd think so. And and I think that what he possesses over the other slightly deeper midfields, midfielders that has have been in the Socceroos squad recently is that touch and turn. Like uh, we saw it for the Mariners last season, obviously, and I haven't watched any of his games while he's been over in the Netherlands, but I'm going to presume it's something that he's continued with. He, w- he was so really, really good at playing with a man on his back and just being able to turn him and, and move into that space in the midfield and, and open things up and where perhaps the, the other midfielders that have played in that role for the Socceroos have been a little bit more cautious and they've looked to recycle possession more than they've looked to turn into the space. I think having someone like Ballard in there, we know that there's a lot of space opening in those areas because of the way that Popovich has had the team set up, at least from the last couple of games with those inverted wingers, you know, flooding the half spaces, etc. It does open up a bit of space in the midfield. And, um, you know, that's something that the likes of Max Ballard from a little bit deeper in that midfield could try and exploit. Um, he's obviously a tremendous talent. And we know that. And, and that's why he's getting these opportunities now. And, and you did mention it's sort of on the brink of the big five but i mean you you look at the netherlands the portuguese league they're sort of already these these ones where they're they're stepping stones into the the big time right like it's where you get a chance to make a name for yourself um it's just one away exactly against like a really strong quality opposition um because you know in in the Netherlands, you've got the likes of Ajax and Feyenoord and, and then the likes who, you know, they are really, really solid teams competing in Europe every year. So it's not like you're just coming up against teams all the same level as you. You're still pushing yourself to be better and better and better. And I think that, you know, the fact that uh, the Dutch press seem to be so just full of praise for him, um, it can only be a good thing. And, uh, you know, I, I think that there'd be obviously serious calls for him to be included whether Popper wants to take that risk or not um who knows you know Saudi Arabia it's that this is we keep saying it about these soccer games but it's the biggest game that they've got um and <laughs> and um you know Goodwin's absence obviously doesn't help things but um you know do you chuck a, a sort of a, a Hail Mary out there and pick Max Ballard and go yeah we're gonna we're gonna give you the nod and and show faith in you who knows but he certainly looks to be developing very well and if it's not this window doubtless will be one of the next couple because yeah he's looking a tremendous talent at the moment Mm. the other question potentially uh, is in the striker position Cassini Yengi was injured during the last window Christian he is back uh, returning to full fitness maybe perhaps not quite there yet Uh, but another name that is being mentioned as direct competition is Mohamed Zure, who is also making his case two goals and two assists in his last three starts for Randers over in Denmark. He's someone who had a little bit of trouble over in France uh, while he was there, but he's made this move uh, over to Scandinavia and seems to be uh, going along quite well. Yeah, he's had a a pretty decent start to the season, hasn't he? Um, You know, obviously Yangi returning back to fitness with that injury um, suffered recently. He hasn't really had much consistency to go by this season. Now, I do think in terms of the number nine position, he is probably the Socceroos' most important player um, in that position along with Mitch Duke because both of them together provide just a bit of something different between them. You know, you've got, you can hold the ball up, you can make runs in behind and Turo, I think, offers, you know, similar traits and qualities as well that he can offer to the table and Popovich may be looking um, as maybe an alternative uh, and maybe just to freshen things up in that department because, you know, you've got the likes of Adam Taggart there who, yes, does perform well in the A-League for the Socceroos. Does he uh, match up like he does in the A-League and perform as he does? He does. He underperforms and that's just the reality of it. And it's whether Popovich keeps giving chance to someone like that or does he turn to a Toure who might yeah offer something different, like I said. So, um, yeah, again, this it's good that there's a lot of depth in options. Um, I think compared to previous years, the Socceroos weren't blessed with that many options in terms of, you know, good promising young talents, you know, coming through. There is a few coming through now and it's just about their versatility and getting that balance right. Um, and I have faith that Popovich will do just that. Mm. And of course, Jacob, as you said, things could change, but the way that we think Popovich will go forward and playing is just with the one striker, whereas yeah. towards the end of Graham Arnold's tenure, it was two. So that's a different dynamic to it. You, do you really need these different profiles to to complement each other on the field or do you just need good strikers who you can sub on for one, yeah. the, one another uh, and impact the game in, in that way? So, yeah, plenty of questions about that. It'll be very interesting to see what Popovich decides to do if you are listening to this after the squad is announced, we're going to have a video up on YouTube 
uh, reaction to the squad as well. So you can get some more up-to-date information there. Uh, but let's go to the Asian competitions in midweek. We're going to start with Sydney FC, who have still not beaten a Japanese team in Asian Champions League competition. I think they can consider themselves a, a little bit unlucky. Jacob, I counted three penalty shouts, yeah. all of which... You know, you've seen given. You have uh, seen them given. That, you've definitely <laughs> yeah. seen them given. I think the second one on Max Burgess is Stonewall. I have that every yeah, single day. And if, there was, yeah. if there was VAR in this competition, I think that would definitely have been given. The other two on any day, flip the coin, whatever you want. Yeah, but that's right. definitely a penalty for, for Max Burgess. And then in terms of refereeing decisions, we don't like to talk about this too much, but Jaden Kaczarski getting absolutely cut down very cynically uh, by Shinji for San Frecce who had committed at least five or six fouls, uh, at the very <laughs> least was getting the attention of Simon Hill, who couldn't stop talking yeah. about it either. Uh, perhaps not the referee because he wasn't on a yellow card up until that point. He, he gets must have been right on the brink and then commits that cynical foul, gets his yellow and then gets substituted off before the ball is even kicked again. So uh, there are definitely a few things that didn't fall Sydney's way, but they had their chances as well. Uh, San Frecce's goalkeeper had a very good night out. Uh, there was that one save, I want to say off Joachim, that was absolutely world-class. Yeah. A few other ones here and there as well. Um, and, you know, San Frecce also had that golden chance on the stroke of half time that they whiffed as well. They had red main scrambling. So on, on the balance of play, probably could have gone either way, but definitely one that uh, Sydney on home soil will feel disappointed with uh, by losing. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it is disappointing. And you, you mentioned unlucky, but you've also got to make your own luck in football. And yes, okay, three penalty shouts, Sean, you don't get given any of them. That is unlucky, but you've also got to then turn around and take the chances that you do create and create enough chances to be able to sort of overcome that. And, you know, Sydney had their chances. Like you mentioned, the goalkeeping was pretty spectacular for San Frecce tonight barely put a foot wrong all all, all evening and uh, just just kept Sydney honest, to be honest. And and it's really difficult for, for the Sky Blues to break into the game, you know, in the attacking third, because when you every chance that you're, you're creating is just being saved. And, you know, it, it's, you know, that, yeah, you mentioned that one incredible save that he had. I think it was off of Wahim. You just, that's got to be demoralizing because you're like, come on, like, when, <laughs> when are we going to, when are we going to get a break here? And this is going to go in the back of the net. Um, but you know, that's the, that's the beauty of having a good goalkeeper, right? Is it can do that. It can demoralize the, the op opposition attackers because they're just like, well, what, what can we do more? Um, and sure, you know, those penalties would have been nice, but what's to say the keeper wouldn't have just saved them anyway with the <laughs> night he was having. So, um, no, it's, it's a disappointing one for Sydney. Um, they've looked very good in this competition as well. I think that's perhaps the most disappointing thing is that, you know, they're, they're, you know, it, it's, it's, they've not been the Mariners, right? <laughs> yeah. That's, that, that's really harsh to say. That's a positive. Say, yeah. Yeah. But you know, they've not been the Mariners. Like they've, they've had some solid performances. They've got points on the board, you know, to, to, to drop, well, not just drop points, but to lose this one as well. That that's the real big sucker punch. I think is that, you know, it was probably pretty even all things said and done, um, you know, with the chances that were created and all of that. And yeah, to, to, be the one to lose that game um it would be yeah massively demoralizing so very disappointing obviously very unlucky and you know we don't like to, to have to comment on refereeing performances like this but they do happen um so i think sydney is just gonna have to you know it's harsh but they're gonna have to get over it they're gonna have to think, move on i think because... this goes to both teams sorry sorry jake it's sydney and central coast it's about managing the game and i think yeah. these asian these top asian sides just do that better than a showing yeah. helps and you just got to be honest about it like even in this game sydney had a, a few good opportunities you can argue about the three penalty shouts but you know you could argue they, they should have had one or two goals and then san Frecho just they just go on these little runs where they just know when they to pinpoint these moments where just to open up the game and, and mm. dominate and i just think even for central coast like there's been times this campaign when in the early stages that they've, they've gone behind a goal and they just defensive lapses in concentration and it's just about picking your moments and yeah. unfortunately it's just i think it comes down to a bit of a lack of experience um because sydney have all you know star started quality but you know, just these asian clubs i don't know what it is but they just they just have it they just know how to do well in these competitions and it's mm -hmm. all about that balance and for now at least the australian clubs just fall behind in that category i don't know if it's 
my mind playing tricks on me because points in these competitions are so much more valuable than in a league, but just because there's so many, uh, like there's few games left, but it feels like all of these AFC games are all decided by moments. Maybe yeah. that speaks to the scarcity of points, but it also speaks to the quality of these teams. Exactly. As you say, Christian, it just, those the moments where little things can happen, like the massive save from the keeper or, you know, the game management. And uh, as much as I criticize the San Freche player, who's probably should have had, a uh, yellow card well earlier in the match. He's doing exactly the best thing that he can for his team in that yeah, situation, yeah. right? So uh, it's just the moments, as you say, maybe it's game management that the Australian clubs just aren't quite It's like It's like a of. patience thing, right? It's a different way to approaching it, I think, is that we've seen the Mariners play patiently, but it's been patience without intent. And I think that's what the Asian clubs do different is that they're patient and they bide their time but they're constantly looking for chances and they're constantly looking like you mentioned Christian for that chance to, to open mm -hmm. things up um, and capitalize. Whereas perhaps Australian teams, when they're being patient, it's to look to slow the game down completely and just settle into a rhythm. And maybe that's where that difference is, is that there's, there's always seems to be the threat, at least from these other sides that, mm -hmm. that the Australian sides don't possess perhaps and and aren't looking to try and, and use as often um and and that's perhaps something that they could try and try and look to do more is it's fine to slow the game down and, and look to control possession but you've got to be acting with intent at all times um especially when it's going to be these thin margins that that get you over the line in games um and especially in a game like this where you know perhaps things aren't quite falling your way you've you've got to make your own luck like i said that's where you've got to be playing with intent you can be slow and be patient and you've still got to try and, and get that ball moving. Um, and and I think that's something that Australian clubs in Asia have always struggled with. And part of that is the, the proactive nature of the Asian sides in pressing the issue. And we know that they like to be very physical and, and commit a lot of fouls to disrupt that rhythm. And it doesn't let the Australian side settle into that, that, that style of control that they like to have. Whereas Asian teams, they can still control a game even when it's chaotic because they know that at any moment they are ready to pounce on an opportunity. And I think it's just that different ap approach to being patient, perhaps that is why they seem to constantly be getting the edge in these matches. And you understand that mentality though, because when you see a Mariners side, for example, get caught on the counter-attack, you just see the quality on the other side of the pitch. And that's yeah. why it's that bit of conservative, defensive conservative approach. But yeah. it's just, like I said, just find that balance between when to go for, when to go up in numbers and when to just sit back a bit, control the game, you know, play a bit of ticket tackle, play a bit of possession, kill the game a bit. It's just those moments, like we've said, and maybe mm -hmm. it might come uh, with time, but it's the consistency because we see clubs like the Mariners coming in and, you know, they keep losing players each season. You've touched on it, Lockie. It's those four big clubs in Australia where preferably we'd like them in because they've got the best chance of succeeding, you know, to that turnover of players. Um, they've got the finances, uh, clubs like the Mariners. It's it's very difficult for them just to, to do well in this competition. Yeah, yeah, it's very difficult indeed. Jacob, in terms of a wider perspective on Sydney, we've now seen three games uh, where we've had no Joe Lolly apart from the first 35 minutes at Auckland, but then no Douglas Costa as well. They yeah. conceded late against Auckland to lose. They barely scraped by uh, against uh, Brisbane. And then of course yep. this loss to San Freche as well. Have we seen enough to say that having those two players out of their team significantly affects them because they should have in theory enough depth. And we've seen the performance of, you know, Jaden Kaczarski is the one that jumps off the page scoring that goal in Brisbane. Uh, yep. But apart from that, if he didn't score that goal, that's one point from three games. Yeah, th things have definitely been stunted a bit. But I think part of that is because they have been so reliant on Lolly over the last, what, how long has he been here? What is it, three years now? Um, three or four years. Three or four, He's, yeah. He has been just such such a, a central part of um, their their attacking game plan. A bit like Ulysses Davila was for, for MacArthur, right? Everything went through him. For Sydney, it sort of has seemed like it's been the same. Um, you know, a lot of attacks go through Lolly and, and he's not just the one creating, he's the one finishing these chances as well. And with Costa in, things looked a bit different, right? There was It was spread a little bit more open and Wahim, I think, has been a um, pretty solid player as well for, for Sydney. But, um, you know, when you're losing such a critical part of the system that you're playing in, of course, things are going to look a little bit disjointed and you're going to struggle perhaps a little bit more. And, you know, you, you can mention depth and, and the fact that Sydney's depth is very, very good, but you, you can't replace somebody like Joe Lolly. You know, it, it's 
it's clubs all around the world. The best clubs in the world suffer from this problem. Man City, when they lost Kevin De Bruyne, right? There were, you know, big question marks about where the creativity was going to come from. Arsenal recently with Erdegaard, you know, Sydney and Joe Lolly is a similar sort of thing where he's such a central part of their attacking output that losing him, um, despite the, the quality of players that they can have to, to replace him with, right, um, in their squad, it, it's still not enough because th there's something intangible to, to the qualities that he has. It's things you can't teach. It's his IQ, his vision, his, his ability to, to beat his man one-on-one -on -one consistently and, and, and be threatening with his shots and things like that and hitting the target consistently. It's stuff that, you know, uh, any player in the world would love to have and, and he just does. Um, and so for Sydney, it, I don't think it's, you know, warning signs or anything because, you know, we have seen them still, you know, they got that result against Brisbane. They were perhaps again, a bit unlucky against Auckland. Um, and this one again, yeah, uh, an unlucky game here against um, San Freche. So I still think that they've been okay and they look like a team who has lost one of their best players and that's because they have. Um, but I don't think it's it's warning signs because they've still shown that they can play some good football. And that's the main thing, right? If it was a case of it had all blown up, they'd lost that game against Brisbane convincingly, you know, and, and they, they really struggled here or something like that. You'd go, well, perhaps, you know, there's more to this than than it seems. But at the moment, it just looks like a team that's lost their their most um, important attacking player. And that's, that's exactly what the case is. So, you know, they're going to struggle, um, as you would expect. But I don't think it's it's time to, you know, wave the white flag and, and be really worried about them because they still look a decent football side. Mm. Finally, before we move on from Sydney as well, a senior debut for 18-year-old Thiago Quintal uh, came on and immediately skipped past his marker in a one-on-one -on -one duel and almost set up the equaliser for Max Burgess. He's been highly spoken of for a little while now uh, in, in the sky blue part of town. Uh, and a very promising first 25 minutes for him. Let's go to the Mariners, Christian, because they did earn their first point in the Champions League Elite this year. Uh, got to start somewhere, I guess. 2 nil down <laughs> against Shanghai Shenhua. Come back to 2-2 on your own turf uh, in front of your home fans is great. Uh, although it did turn out that about a third of the people in the stadium uh, <laughs> were Shanghai Shenhua fans, which is quite amazing, really. Yeah, it was about, what, 850 fans in the stadium for Shanghai. It was, yeah, a pretty good effort by them. And you see a lot the Asian clubs coming out in force away from home. Mm. They like to travel a lot. And it's just unfortunate here that we can't even get our fans to attend the home games in the Asian <laughs> competitions. Um, like, it is sad in a way, but it's just the reality of this competition, unfortunately. And, you know, we just hope it changes in the meantime. But, I mean, I guess in terms of the game, I touched on it earlier. It's just, it's always these slow starts in the Mariners that, I don't know, for whatever reason, they just get a bit timid or the opposition just pick out their weaknesses straight away and they just they just freeze. Um, I just don't know how else to explain it really. Um, obviously mm -hmm. going 2-0 down, but you just got to give them credit um, for that great fight back. I don't know what it is about them and these late goals in, in the Champions League <laughs> yeah. at the moment, um, just making us sweat and, and really you know be nervous. But um, no, I mean, at home, you had to think, I know Shanghai Shenhua is a top side. They challenged Shanghai poor in the Chinese Super League. So um, obviously they've got the quality, but you'd have to think in Gosford to have any sort of chance, you know, to even make at least the seventh, eighth position, they had to at least get a point from this game. That's why that goal at the end was um, vitally crucial for them, um, you know, let alone the coefficient rankings, all that sort of stuff. So in terms of confidence boosting, I mean, yes, um, but in terms of the actual play in general, um, I just, I would still like to see a bit more from the Mariners going forward. Um, oh, yeah. Just, yeah, it just, it's too stagnant at times. And, yeah. you know, going off from last season, there's just two contrasting teams. And, you know, it's just the same manager. I know there's been a bit of player turnover, but, you know, there's still the same philosophy in place. It's just, I don't know, even in the A-League as well, you can't just put it down to the Champions League and the good quality of size. In the A-League, we've been seeing as well that they've struggled as well to, to implement those ideas going forward. They just... Yeah, they're really struggling at the moment and it's just where they can turn it around. They proved last season after four rounds, after those four defeats that, you know, they did turn complete U-turn. Uh, but whether they can do it this time around, it's going to have to, yeah, be a wait and see. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, they did lose their first four games in the league last year and then go on to do what they did. But Jacob, as you mentioned off the top, it's now eight competitive games played this season across the Australia Cup, the A-League and the Champions League Elite. Uh, zero wins. And mm. that's a lot harder to come back from than, than four. So 
Look, it's going to be tough for the Mariners to turn it around. And you talked about uh, a team like Sydney relying on someone like Joe Lolly. Uh, it, it seems, and I know you've made this observation as well, that perhaps that same role has fallen to Mikel Docker and it's led to a bit of a, a positional crisis in terms of where do you actually play him to get the best output for the team? Yeah, I, I think Mark Jackson and the Mariners are really missing Nisbet, obviously. He was far and away one of the best players in the league last season. And not having him centrally, I mean, they've been going mostly with Steele and McCalman in a double pivot, which, I mean, they're both, you know, fantastic players, but, you know, they don't quite have that creative quality that Josh Nisbet did where he could just drive with the ball and, and just create something and find a nice pass and things like that. And, you know, they're perhaps a little bit more reserved in possession. And so Jackson's been really looking towards Mikael Docker as his big creative outlet and going, right, how do we get you involved? And he's sort of been used in a couple of different ways this season. Um, and we saw him in this one sort of used in like a left-hand eight sort of role, inverting into the central areas. And I think the, the thinking behind it was um, to, to try and get him as as that creative force in the midfield that Nisbet was last season. Um, but of course, very different profiles of players where, where Docker likes to actually be out wide perhaps a little bit more. And we then saw Jackson make an adjustment in that second half and Docker moved into a sort of right wing back. Um, and he looked a lot more fluid on the ball. He looked a lot more intentful and, and aggressive on the ball, playing a bit deeper and a bit wider where he has done, you know, a lot of his career, at least with the Mariners, he's played out wide and, and as a fullback. But it is, you're, you're spot on, Lockie. It's this sort of positional crisis because I think everybody there is, is sort of realising Docker is going to be the key to this side moving forwards, at least for this season in terms of getting the best out of them in attack. But where do you play him to, to be able to get the, that out of him that's actually going to help help the side because if you're playing him as this wing back as this fullback um you can't ask him to do too much in attack because he's still got his defensive duties to to do and with a man as side that's looked a little bit shaky defensively as well compared to to what they were like last season you need the help all the help you can get um in transitional defense which you know is something that docker can do when he's a fullback but he can't do when he's playing a bit higher up the pitch perhaps so you know it's trying to find i mean christian mentioned it earlier in terms of in and out of possession it's about finding that balance and i think finding the balance for docker is going to be really difficult because where while you can play him happily as a winger last season where you have a much stronger defensive unit that's not the case this season um but you can't play him as a defender this season and also expect him to have the same attacking output that he he did last season so um yeah they're sort of stuck between a rock and a hard place here because they know the talent that he has um and it, it's about finding where it's going to work i think he definitely looked better playing wide Wider and playing deeper as a fullback, as a wingback. Um, I don't think he's looked fantastic in the midfield. And I think it's because the spaces are perhaps a little bit more congested. The timing is a lot tighter and quicker. You have to be just on it a, a lot more in the centre of the park. Um, and that's obviously one of the things that you look for in a midfielder is how quickly can they make their decisions. And Docker's a fantastic player, don't get me wrong, but it's not. I still don't think he's quite got that sharpness in him to make those decisions quick enough. Um, and it's then helped, but not helped by the fact that there's not really, he is, if he is playing in that midfield position, he is the creative outlet in the midfield. So he doesn't really have anyone else to work with there, which is something that he likes to do when he is out wide. He likes to work with, you know, it, whether it be the winger or one of the strikers, if they move across when, when they're playing with two strikers, um, he likes to operate really well with those to create two versus ones. So yeah, it's going to be difficult for Jackson to find where it works um, for Docker. Um, and I think that in January, they're going to have to look at perhaps going, right, we are going to be playing you in this position for the rest of the season. And we're going to be bringing in somebody else to play in that other position that we would have played you in mm. otherwise. Um, I think they've just got to make a choice and stick with it because constantly switching isn't going to help things. You either brave it out, keep him in the midfield and hope that he can sort of find that sharpness and that quickness. Or you go, right, we know the quality that you possess when you're playing as a wing back. So we're going to go with that. And then we're going to have to look to bring somebody in who can be a creative outlet for us in the center of the park because at the moment you can't have one player to, doing two jobs you know yeah absolutely in terms of the mariners chances to qualify for the next phase of this competition of course eight of the 12 teams in the east go through it is obviously getting harder and harder the, the longer they go without winning in the competition an odd quirk is because we're playing eight games rather than six we play six in this calendar year alongside the afc uh, mm -hmm. Champions League 2 with Sydney FC. And then there's a long gap between their last game in early December uh, to mid-February for the last two games. So obviously in that time, a lot of things can change. 
But the eighth place team, Kawasaki Frontale, who they do play in that February window, are already on six points. So mm. we, we've been saying it along uh, nine, ten points, somewhere around there. Three wins, definitely, or at least three wins worth of points. And the draws are out of the equation now for the Mariners. So they're going to have to win at least one of these games in this next patch to then give themselves a hope in the new year. Uh, and the two teams they're coming up against, uh, Vissel Kobe, who currently sit top of J1 and top of the AFC Champions League East table, and Yokohama F. Marinos, who sits in third. Oh, so it's gonna be it doesn't get time. easier. <laughs> it doesn't. It doesn't get easier, and they're running out of opportunities. So uh, I'm almost ready to put the line through them, to be honest. But just the fact that those last two games are so far away, things can change. Uh, mm. But yeah, we're getting into dire straits now. Let's bring it back to the A-League, shall we? Because the teams are in for round four. And unfortunately, Christian, there's a lot of devastation across the board. We saw on Monday night uh, a lot of injuries for Melbourne City. Um, Andrew Naboo has confirmed to be out for the season with an ACL, uh, similarly to Brad Tapp. Uh, and then Marco Tilio, a four- to six-week hamstring as well. So for Melbourne City specifically, they're going to have to rely a lot on their academy players for replacements. They do get James Jago back from suspension. Uh, but those injuries in particular, and for those players who just came in and showed so much promise early in the season, all three of them, that's really devastating to see them out for so long. Yeah, Naboo, ACL especially, is just devastating to see. And we spoke about City and a bit of a aging squad, I guess, and Naboo and Lecky being a couple of examples. And these are the risks that you're going to have to take. Uh, we know they're injury prone. They're, they're going to get pick up some niggles during the season. It's just in their nature they've done in seasons past and Vidmar would have known that coming into the season. I think that's why he's turning to the, to the youth side a bit more. Um, he understands the long-term future of this club and it's just about adapting and hopefully they can plug those holes because, you know, they've got a game now against Perth Glory away from home where Perth are very much in the shadow of getting their first win of the season. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be yeah a very tricky situation for Vidmar to try and pull the club out of. But, you know, if there's one experienced manager in the league who can do it, it's Vidmar. So, yeah, we just have to wait and see. We talked about Joe Lolly. He is back in the match day squad for Sydney, but it will still have to wait and see. Given he didn't, you know, start tonight, yeah. you'd have to imagine there's still uh, no certainty that he'll be in the starting 11. They definitely will have to wait a little bit longer for Douglas Costa, who didn't make the team. Uh, Lawrence Thomas for the Wanderers is not in the squad, but was described as 50 50 by Alan Stadick in midweek. So, uh, if Alex Roof approved anything on the weekend is that being left out on Thursday doesn't necessarily <laughs> rule you out of the weekend as well. Uh, and then for Wellington, Palo Retro is also back in the squad. And then for the Adelaide Western United game as well, two key defensive ins, Ben Garuccio, uh, the captain of Western United, and then Jacob, finally, Bart Vreens, the Dutch he might wizard. Make, might literally be on the pitch for the first time since coming to Australia, which would be a huge boost for an Adelaide defence that has been riddled with injuries already um, and injury scares as well with, with Panakikianis going down against the Mariners in round one. So um, that's a huge, and I'm not expecting him to start and I'm honestly not expecting him to get any minutes whatsoever unless there is an injury um, because I think it's just foolish to, to rush somebody back um especially at his age he's not not a young guy um you know obviously immensely talented but um th there's no point rushing back somebody if you think that they're gonna need to be a, a central part of of the squad moving forwards and potentially risking having him out for the season if he re-aggravates anything and Ben Garuccio back for for Weston is is massive as well because we, we know the inexperience that they have in that squad um and in their their defensive and, and midfield units especially that that's one of the big problems perhaps is that there is a little bit of an experience so Garuccio is sort of a big leader now at that team he's been around for a few seasons and, and has sort of has become I suppose that the face of the club in in recent years having him back is going to be huge and uh, uh, really sort of fills fills a nice gap defensively and, and offers, obviously offers a lot going forwards as well out wide which which Weston will, will will hopefully look to exploit and you know with Hiroshi Ibasuki in the box perhaps Garuccio will be able to give him some service from out wide with, with some crosses so it'll be interesting to see how he's used if he's used um, but no massive ins for both sides um, and then yeah Palo Retro back for, for the Phoenix I want to touch on as well because um, we've sort of spoken about the Phoenix this season is perhaps using those injuries to to retro and um Rojas. oh Rojas that's it um 
and, and sort of going, oh, well, you know, it's not their full squad. They're missing these key players. To, to see Paolo Retro back, um, that's a good sign for them in that they're able, that they're hopefully going to be able to start to, to bring him into match day squads and, and, and give him, giving him some minutes. And, and that might sort of reinvigorate perhaps a little bit of the spark that they've lost. Uh, you know, they still look a very good team and, and they're right up the top of the table. Obviously it's only been three rounds, but um, they, they still haven't quite looked the same team that they were last season. Um, and I think that someone like a Paolo Retro, if he can come back in uh, sooner rather than later, that's going to be a huge in for them because he offers something going forwards that perhaps they haven't had this season. And, and mm. yeah, that could be massive. Well, another key in this week was some very encouraging viewership numbers through from Channel 10 for the first few weeks of the A-League men's competition. 1.09 million unique people have watched the A-League on Network 10 so far this campaign. Uh, so that's not a cumulative uh, added on from each game. That is total individual people who have watched at least one game. Uh, but that figure is up, Christian, 48% on rounds one to three last season, which is a big jump. Now, there is one or two asterisks uh, on that. My understanding of the reach statistic is that the way that we have the Saturday doubleheader this year with the, the bridge show in between takes advantage of the way that is calculated. So maybe there's a small boost there. And obviously, we've seen a lot of uh, high ticket matches in the first three rounds as well with the Sydney Derby, the Melbourne Derby and the Kiwi Derby. But even with those uh, classifiers on it, that is still a big jump and a big indication that things are going in the right direction at the moment. Hey, we're not going to complain about any boost. We'll take any boost that, that we can get, honestly. Because um, you know, we've seen the hype before the season. And it's not really that much of a surprise to see a 48% um, uptick in terms of the numbers there. And obviously, um, you know, with the new deal, the broadcasting deal in place, um, you know, to have over just a million um, unique viewers, I mean, that surely says something that there's more of a reach now. Uh, perhaps the advertising has improved a bit as well. Uh, more people are sort of aware, obviously, with the, the marquee signings of Juan Mats and Douglas Costa, we just can't understate how much of an impact they have just on, you know, the broader interest of the game here. Um, and that's helped, you know, significantly, um, you know, adding, you know, the pregame shows as well, um, you know, the Saturday, Saturday night um, pregame, all these sort of little entertainment shows um, during the week, it just really engages the interest and just hopefully we see these numbers skyrocket even further. Yeah, of mm. course. So we had the, the audience for the Sydney Derby alone, one matter and Douglas Costa was four and a half hundred thousand, something around that. So obviously that that's our strategy with these marquees, right? It's to get mm -hmm. people in the door, get their foot in the door, and then we'll, we'll try to use the, the selling points of the league to, to have them stick around. But yes, yeah. great numbers off the top, uh, and let's hope it continues. And of course, the A-League women's has started this uh, past weekend as well. Let's hope that the growth in TV can be replicated for them as well. Uh, you, you will notice, obviously, we're not talking about the A-League women as much on this show. If you want to, we have a new podcast called The Dubcast. Uh, Paletti and Burke do a great job. And Christian, you joined them this week talking about round one. So uh, its own dedicated space for women's football this year at Round Ball Australia. Uh, so go, go check out The Dubcast. Let's get into our weekend look for round four. We're starting off with a burning question as always. And I'm going to kick us off and I'm going to say... Can Luke Bratton or Hiroshi Ibasuki get revenge on their former clubs? It's <laughs> MacArthur v. Sydney and Adelaide v. Western. I think there's a couple of great narratives there. Um, yep. You wouldn't say maybe that there was uh, negative implications with their moves, but definitely two players that, if probably they had it their own way, would have preferred to stay at their former clubs, mm. uh, but were not required for this campaign. So uh, I think it'll be interesting to see if they come back into these matchups uh, with something to prove. Jacob. Mine is, can City score goals without any attacking players? Because <laughs> at the moment, they're all injured. Um, and, and we did It's like, can Adelaide on... keep a clean sheet without any of the players? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, we did sort of touch on they're going to be relying on, on youth and their academy players um, to sort of stand up and, and make a name for themselves. So perhaps there is going to be a little bit of fire and, and you know, we could see some goals, but I'm very doubtful. Um, and the yeah. quality that they've lost, especially now Naboo out for the season, that's huge. Um, so, yeah, can they can they actually score any goals now? It's going to be interesting to see. Yeah, I think with, with Matt Leckie still questionable as if he could run out 90 minutes or not, then you get Suleimani, Naboo and Caputo. That I make it their four preferred striking options yep. now unavailable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so it, it might be Jonas and Cohen. That's kind of my ballpark guess as to who might line up centrally, but really anything could happen. It could be crazy. Mm. Christian. 
mine is will the real Western Sydney Wanderers stand up? Because <laughs> over the past three games, they have been you know close to atrocious. It must be said, you know. Um, obviously losing the derby, which let's be honest, most people expected the quality just shone through there. But then against Western United, you thought, okay, some cracks are starting to appear here. And then that 4-3 loss against Adelaide, I mean, we sort of knew that their defensive issues, but not to that extent. That was pretty <laughs> horrific. I know Vidakovic had a howler and he's a young kid, young keeper who's going to, you know, make those mistakes early in his career. Stadge said after the game that, you know, the team's going to put their arms around him, which is great. Uh, but in terms of the balance of the side, it's going to be interesting against, you know, they're at home now against Newcastle Jets Friday night um, as people listening to this. So, yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see if they can you know, form some kind of response because they have to. If they don't win in these in their first four games, it's going to ask you know, more questions with stages. The fans are going to get on the club's back, the ownership. Um, so, yeah, it's going to be really testing times. Have you considered, I'm... Christian, that maybe this is the real Western Sydney Wanderers that we're seeing? <laughs> like, like, well, I don't be- well, no, personally, I don't believe that because I tipped them first to win. The- <laughs> <laughs> so I cannot have that as a reality. I still have faith in them. It's just... Refuses yeah, to accept a- it. <laughs> yeah. <I'm confused. laughs> well, I'm actually going to jump off the back of you for my worst case scenario. And it's that the Wanderers capitulate again. And uh, you explained it beautifully there. You know, Vidakovic had a terrible game and that's something that I'd, I'd hazard a guess that most good keepers experience one or, once or twice in their career. Uh, that yeah. kind of that wake up call is, oh yeah, you know, that can happen if I have a bad day, right? Um, but to me, the, there's issues in their team as well. And their midfield uh, was a real question mark. Uh, I brought it up the other day, but that ball that Zach Clough played through for the final goal, just huge, huge gap in midfield that he was allowed to just walk into. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. And so the defense has not, you know, showed themselves in any great quality so far this season anyway, uh, as well. So uh, yeah, if they fall apart again, uh, I'm starting to lose hope. And I'm actually starting to get very worried for Alan Stajic. He's only on a one year deal. Yeah. Um, so that's obviously Western Sydney's management playing their cards close to their chest and leaving themselves with options. So uh, if they, they have another bad loss this weekend, I'm already seeing warning signs for his future at the club. And there was a crazy stat I saw as well, where his win percentage in the in the league is like really not very good, um, considering the number of games that he's played. Um, and you know, I, he's always had this, you know, perception of being a, a, a decent coach, but the numbers at least would would tend to suggest otherwise. So you know, it, it could be yeah, a case like you said well, of when of the Mariners made that be... comeback, he was there, wasn't he? He was sort of the yeah. coach who started yeah. that run. So you, yeah, it's interesting. He goes on these phases where you know he didn't have the resources then, and he was able to build them up. I just think he needs a bit of time. He just needs a bit of patience with the club. But we know a club of the size of the Wanderers, the patience it can run thin pretty quickly. Yeah. All right, keep us going, Jacob. Um, well, mine is also the continuation of bad performances, but for another club, and it's the Mariners. And, you know, if they drop points again, I mean, come on, guys, get it together. Um, you <laughs> to know, Wellington, yeah, though. To, to Wellington. Um, yeah. Defending champions. A, a good side, but something's got, to, something's got to change for the Mariners at some point. And, yeah, okay, they Oh, but we all wrote them off last season and then they went on another spectacular run. But again, this would make it then nine games in a row with, without a win, which is just not a good sign at all that they've not they've not won us in, in the last nine. That's not a good record to have. Um, and I think that, you know, it could be pretty, pretty poor for them for the rest of the season if they can't, can't show some signs of life here early on because, um, you know, they've played... Probably more football than than most other sides in the league. Um, you know, with all their Asian games and things like that. Obviously, some of the clubs went on deeper runs in the cup, etc. But um, you know, there, there's really there's no excuses to not be not be near the top of their game, give, given the amount of football that they have played. And yet, they're still looking like they're trying to figure things out. Obviously, we spoke a lot about that earlier. Um, so yeah, I think if they drop points again, then then that's going to be huge for them because they really need to start to turn things around. Christian, I think you're on the same vibe as well, right? Yeah, 100% uh, with the Mariners as well, but also with Perth Glory. That's my one um, because if Perth, if they lose to Melbourne City, a team who 
you know, we expect Perth to actually finally get their first three points of the season against the defeat. <laughs> hold, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. No, I gotta, I, you say we. Do we expect? <laughs> do we expect what, sorry? Do we do we actually expect Perth Laurie to win this game? With the outs of City? I mean, it's a real yeah, possibility. Yeah, but per- it's Perth Glory, though. It's a possibility, but is it the expectation? Okay, I probably would have... <laughs> uh, yeah, I probably would have poorly, but it's okay. a good chance. You'd have to say, at home in Perth. Yeah, I yes. mean, against a, yeah, against a City side who, you know, haven't looked overly convincing. And to add to the injury woes as well, I mean, if Perth lose this game, they've obviously got a new ownership coming in that's happened in the off-season. So if another loss was to eventuate... I just think it would be a disaster for the club because it's like, where are we going? Where's the direction? What does the future look like? Um, so I think in that aspect, it could look you know pretty bleak and scary f- for the fans to to ponder. So I do think mm. that they really desperately need a win just to sort of calm things down. Um, yeah, I do think it'd be quite a disaster that if they don't at least get a point. Now, I, I need to word this carefully so I don't come off as a hypocrite. Uh, but <laughs> my my ping from distance God. is that Perth Glory could get their first win. Uh, they yeah. could. It might happen. <laughs> yeah, it's it not. Might. It's not expected. It's, it's not yeah. the expectation. See, I don't think they go in his favour. When I saw, sorry, when I saw that, when you put it through in the rundown or in the group chat, I thought that's not a ping from distance because for me, I think that there's a real possibility. <laughs> so that's that's not really a ping from distance. Well, there is, is a real possibility anyway. Okay, I'll just make my argument. Right, I just okay. think that. <laughs> It, it, to, to your point that if they lose, it's bad. It, it's probably proof that they reset too hard, right? And if you reset too hard with all these young players, then you know you still need to be able to be competitive in games of football for these players to develop, right? Mm-hmm. Um, but I think with the outs of City, as you say, the argument is there that this is their chance. They're back at home. They need to have a response. Surely they get amped up for it. And Melbourne City are really going to struggle to find a path from goal if Perth Glory can just get their defending to some sort of satisfactory level. So uh, in terms of looking down the list of every single club in the league, in terms of teams you kind of want to play right now this week at home, get Melbourne City to travel o- all the way over, I think it's probably one of the best chances for Perth. Mm. Jacob? For sure. Um, yeah, definitely a, a good chance for Perth and a good chance for another team as well, I think. Uh, there's just something in me that thinks the Roar are going to keep victory honest this week. Um, I, I don't, I'm not sure why. Obviously, the victory looked very, very strong this season. The Raw, they, perhaps it was just me being blinded by that game against Sydney where they kept Sydney honest, um, mm. uh, you know, and, and I think that they might be able to turn around and do it again to the victory. Um, the, there's there's something there. They just had moments in that game against Sydney where they did look like a solid team and you could sort of see why lucky you were so high on them in our preseason predictions because, you know, they did look like a decent side at times against Sydney. And um, I just think that if they can carry that momentum on, there's no reason why they, they can't do the same against the victory. This isn't a predictions game, so I can pose a question. What does honest mean? What does keep honest mean? Are they, are they well, still you know, going to lose? Well, well, I mean, it's going to be, you know, it'll be a close game. They're, they're not just going to get completely run over yeah. sort of thing. Like, you know, it, it'll be, you know, a tight victory win. They might even nab a point, perhaps if they play well enough, steal the victory. But they're not going to be, yeah, just completely steamrolled by the victory. They're, they're going to put up a, a decent fight and make sure that the victory actually working for the win. Finish this off, Christian. Yeah, so I've done a bit of research and digging here. So I've said a red card to be shown in the Sydney v. MacArthur game. So get this right. They've played 11 times recently. In eight of those games, there's been a red card. The previous five games, there's been a red card. And the last match they played, if you remember, MacArthur got those two red cards in the one game. Um, so it could be a feisty affair and we could see a red card, maybe from the management, maybe an assistant coach, but it won't matter for me because I don't <laughs> Clarifying it this time. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It won't matter though. So. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's yeah. fine. Very nice. All right, there's our weekend look. It's going to be a, a good week of A-League football. To finish us off tonight, uh, we're going to talk about the APL. Uh, they held their annual general meeting on Monday and re-elected three directors to the board. Uh, now, the story here is not necessarily the people that got re-elected, but it's the manner in which they were appointed. Simon Hill on the Global Game and uh, the Asian Games, Paul Williams, have been both venting their frustrations about the lack of details around the election process itself, uh, despite consistent efforts from those two to ask the APL about these procedures. Uh, they've been met with silence. And now, of course, the thing that we have to keep remembering is that the APL is a private company. They do not have a public obligation to release this kind of information. However, Jacob, 
being stewards of football and the sport and, and that is in the public interest of a lot of people around this country, uh, the argument could be made they have a moral obligation to do so. Uh, but either way, we're still expecting more independent directors to be appointed in the next few months. I believe the number is two uh, to the six-person mm-hmm. board um, that is currently appointed. But yeah, it, it's just, again, the APL have done a lot right in the last year um, from my perspective and even 18 months. Uh, but it's things like this that, that that aren't necessarily bad things, but they're, they're just they're, they're not making it easy for themselves and they're leaving room for bad things to happen. Uh, and I think more than anything, uh, given everything we've gone through in the last few years, people really just want transparency. Yeah. Uh, look, I'm, the, the thing that's, that's a, perhaps a bit um, disappointing is not that they didn't make it public straight away, but that even though people have been asking about them, they've not, they've not at least given a response about the, the procedure that's taken place. That's where it's a little bit like, uh, I can understand because you're not le- legally obligated to not releasing it that first time. But then when people are actually asking and are showing interest in these sorts of things, it's a show of good faith when you've just come off the back of a period where the fans despised you, um, you know, and, and there, there was serious consideration that perhaps splitting from FA was a bad thing. And we all know how it went with FA back in the day as well. So, you know, when, when that was what you were up against, like you said, Lockie, over the last 12 months to do so much to, to sort of repair that and be transparent and open just to then not be here for something that seems relatively trivial in the grand scheme of things. Right. I mean, obviously you're appointing people to, to the board. That's huge because they, they have a lot of say over the way that the game goes, but you know, it's not even about that. We know who's been appointed. It's about, how they were appointed it's something as 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 seminal as that and yet it's it's still not being um publicly spoken about and that's where it's yet yeah, that frustration that you mentioned you know it is quite frustrating that you're not able to get something like that out of them despite repeated attempts to so um look uh, hopefully hopefully it comes out and um, we can sort of put this behind us but it's not a good look as it stands because yeah they have done so much right and this sort of goes against what they have been building towards over the last few months especially christian after such a good start to the a leg everyone was so positive about the marketing campaign that went into the season launch this year and everything seems to be on a very positive note just from my perspective just don't give anyone a reason to to crawl that mm. back at the moment and that's always been the criticism, hasn't it? When things always seem to be on the up, there's always a little bit of dip and just that bit of disappointment where it's just, it's so easy just to come out and just be transparent, just communicate with the fans. Cause that's at the end of the day, that's just what they want, right? Because we saw the grand final decision. It, it wasn't communicated with hardly anybody until later on where it was just in the outside of the blue. And, I think fans still would have been frustrated, but at least if they just came out and been honest with them from the start, then okay, they would have maybe respected it a bit more. It's just these little things where I don't see the big deal and just being honest and, uh, you know, just saying it how it is, how is the process work, all of this stuff. So, yeah, it is frustrating. Um, I can see why it would be frustrating for the fans in particular. Yeah, absolutely. Well, speaking of fans, uh, we had a fan write in. I've got a question for you, Christian, off the back of our, <laughs> what a our most recent podcast. Uh, Roxy Down Under says, in response to what Christian said about Cahill knowing that the A-League is on, uh, they say, I highly doubt Tim Cahill has stayed in touch with what happens in our domestic league, his lack of interest in Australian football and only using it for his own personal profit is very mm-hmm. self-evident. Yeah, I agree that he's probably doing it for his self-interest, but I don't believe Kay was that naive to think that the A-League is or not. I, I'd like to assume that he knew that the start of the season, like this is a player who's played in the league before. He played for Melbourne City. He knows about the A-League. So, I mean, I think it's a bit of a stretch to say that he didn't know about it. Fair enough. Yeah, look, it, yeah. it's an interesting situation as well. And I was listening to a few more opinions on it this week and uh, they talked about it on the global game. And I think... You know, people didn't like the whole kind of financial aspect of it, but I think they can respect it for what it was. It's just the clash with the A-League, right? That's what we really didn't like. Mm-hmm. And uh, hopefully there'll be a little more um, courtesy, potentially, is the right word, 
uh, for these things in the future. But that will do for this episode of the Round Ball Australia podcast. Don't forget, if you want to win a pair of free tickets to Unite Rounds, uh, the entry form is in the description. Tell us your favourite A-League moment and answer a couple other questions about the show for us. Uh, and please do leave comments on, on Spotify, on Apple Podcasts, on Twitter, wherever you want. If you want to get in touch, and we'll, we'll talk about them on the show as well. But Christian Monskin, thank you tonight and copping the heat from fans. Thank you, Lockie. Yeah, what's, what's new, really? So I'm obviously... <laughs> yeah, it's cops enough. it from us, cops it from the fans now. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> absolutely does. Thank you for piling on with me, Jacob Stevens. That's all right. Anytime. <laughs> all right. We'll be back on Tuesday for another week of A-League football. And of course, uh, back on YouTube on Friday in the afternoon to react to the Socceroos squad as well. But thank you all very much for listening. We appreciate your company. Goodbye.